Hello Guyana and welcome to another program of the public interest. I am Malika Ramsey. This week we focus on what many of us, or I should say who many of us, still call the founding father of Guyana. On the 20th of February, that's Wednesday the 20th of February 2013, Lyndon Forbes Samson Burnham would have celebrated his 90th birthday. And this week we focus on Mr. Burnham's vision and his initial plans for Guyana. And of course, with me is Mr. David Granger. David Granger is the opposition leader and leader of the People's National Congress Reform. Welcome back, sir. Good morning, Mike. Thank you. All right. And I take this opportunity to wish you a happy republic, you and the entire Guyana happy republic. Thank you. All right. Could I join you in wishing yes. our um, viewers a happy Republic Day? Uh, which will be celebrated on Saturday, the 23rd of February. All right. Thank you very much. I want to start by asking you, sir, because I know you would have worked closely with Mr. Forbes Burnham. What was Burnham's vision for Guyana? Well, Burnham's vision was very complex. Um, in order to understand someone who was born 90 years ago, um, you have to put yourself in the historical context. Imagine what Guyana was like um, 90 years ago. Imagine his own upbringing and his education. Um, in order to analyze Burnham's life, I've tried to look at it at four different levels, at um, what we call the levels of analysis. Look at it at the personal level, at the political or communal level, the national level, and the international level. So when I consider his worldview, I start by looking at that boy 90 years ago growing up in, in Kitty. At that time, Guyana was very poor. We were a colony. We were actually called British Guyana. Nobody used the name Guyana at all. It was British Guyana. And at the end of every major war, there is always a depression. Um, that is when the soldiers return. You have a lot of unemployment. You don't have sufficient food. People are indebted. You know, and this is exactly what happened at the end of the First World War. So Guyana was in a state of depression at the time that Burnham was, was uh, born. And that is when the British Guyana Labour Union was established. And viewers may be surprised to know that Burnham actually met Hubert Critchlow, the founder of the British Guyana Labour Union, in his father's home in Stanley Place Kitty, because his father was a close friend of Hubert Critchlow. But generally, there was uh, widespread malnutrition, there was disease, epidemic disease, there was a lot of unemployment, housing was very poor um, and meager, um, the roads were poor, education, most people could only aspire to primary school education. So I think for the masses of Guyanese, um, life, living conditions were very poor. Political conditions are also very poor because um, in order to vote, um, males had to have a certain income or a certain property. So if you were poor, you couldn't vote, and women couldn't vote. Uh, at the same time, most of our industries uh, were controlled by Europeans, and few Guyanese owned any um, you know, major manufacturing or productive enterprises. So he grew up in uh, an atmosphere of, uh, I would say, poverty. And I think that shaped his worldview. He developed a love for the masses, and he developed a conviction that the ordinary people must be given a, a better opportunity to improve themselves. And the second thing I must mention um, is that his education also contributed to his worldview, the way he saw himself, the way he saw British Guyana, and the way he saw um, the people of Guyana are developing. Now, I think the most significant, everyone knows that he won the Guyana Scholarship, the British Guyana Scholarship, and all that. Um, but what was significant is that when he went to England to take up the scholarship at the University of London, um, he met many third world leaders, people like Kwame Nkrumah, Seretsi Kama from Botswana, Abubakar Tafawa Baleo from Nigeria, Errol Barrow from uh, Barbados, um, George Padmore, CLR James from Trinidad. And I think he developed a great attachment to them. 
in terms of their ideas and how they wanted to change the colonial world. They were all anti-colonial. They all wanted the freedom, the freedom. He also got involved. Um, he was president of the West Indies Student Union, and he went to Prague, which is in Czechoslovakia. At that time, it was a communist country. He went to Congress in, 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 uh, in Paris. He got involved in the Caribbean Labour Congress. He got involved in the League of Colored Peoples. And there might have been some association with the British Communist Party. Um, another aspect of his education in England was the fact that while he was there in 1945, the wartime government led by Winston Churchill was, uh, that was a Conservative Party government. The Conservatives lost the election and the Labour government um, was elected. And that Labour government was led by uh, Prime Minister Clement Attlee. Now, Attlee was a socialist, and it was Attlee who introduced the National Insurance Act. Attlee nationalized you know, coal, gas, electricity, and the, air, and the air, um, railways. Attlee introduced the um, National Health Service. So I think um, we got the impression that Burnham felt, and many third world leaders felt, that in order to move the bulk of the population out of poverty, nationalization was the solution, and that um, there had to be better protection for the working people in terms of national insurance, workers' compensation, and so on. So I think uh, Burnham's ideas um, were molded both in British Guyana, in the community in which he grew up, at the, at the national level, and also with his exposure to people from other third world countries in Britain and his exposure to socialism. So by the time he was, let's say, in his mid-twenties and he had completed his studies in law in England, I think we saw Burnham who was now getting ready to take on the role of national leadership. Do you believe, and I know he's been accused of being a dictator, uh, do you believe that his exposure to socialism and to uh, studying in Britain and his exposure to all these third world uh, leaders, third world, world country leaders, somehow contributed to him being a dictator? And of course that is if you agree that he was a dictator. But he certainly was not a dictator. The, the, the doctrine of socialism uh, requires strong central government, mm -hmm. not necessarily dictatorial government, because Attlee was elected um, democratically in England, mm -hmm. and um, by 1951 he lost the election and he had to resign as prime minister. Similarly, Forbes Burnham uh, got into power by being elected, and he remained in power um, through the process of elections. Now, um, I don't see anything dictatorial what we see is strong central government. And you needed strong central government if the working people were to be given an opportunity um, to develop themselves, particularly in the form of national insurance, which was introduced in, in uh, 1969. Even before it became a republic, we had national insurance. That can only be introduced by a strong central government. It can't be introduced by private sector. Um, we had education reforms, the construction of the University of Guyana. All of these things required strong central government. Um, and this is what Burnham did. So he was not a dictator at all. Um, I should also point out that in the second phase of his life, bearing in mind the education could be regarded as the early phase, in the middle phase of his life, um, he had gone to Kingston, Jamaica, where he had studied the constitution of the People's National Movement, uh, sorry, the People's National Party, which was founded by um, Norman Manley, that's Michael Manley's father. And when he came back to Guyana in 1949, it was Forbes Burnham who wrote the constitution of the original People's Progressive Party. So um, it was a democratic constitution, and he was democratically elected chairman of the PPP. Um, after he left the PPP in 1955, he set up his own party, the People's National Congress, and he, again he was democratically elected um, leader of the People's National Congress. And he was challenged. It is not as though it was an easy victory. Um, it's not as though he demanded to be leader. 
he was democratically elected. People challenged him. Raul Farley challenged him. Um, and he won the elections fair and square. So throughout his life, he was democratic. And um, I don't think there's any um, evidence to support the view that he was dictatorial. He was accused and, in a sense, continued to be accused by persons who obviously are not Barnum supporters of, of you know, rigging elections, being too powerful. That probably links back to being a di dictator. Uh, how do you plan, of course, in this case as the PNC leader, how do you plan to help preserve some of his work and to get the truth out there so that especially the young persons can know that this is the Barnum or this was the Barnum and not what some of them are being thought now? Well, that's a good question. Um, many persons living today never saw Barnum at all. I mean, he'd been dead for 28 years. So if you were, you know, like yourself, 25 years old, um, you would never have seen Burnham. You, you can only judge Burnham from what you read about him and what other people tell you about him. Now, the People's National Congress has a plan to preserve the work of Burnham, um, both by visual images, we are now collecting photographs, um, and we will copy those photographs to put on exhibition. So instead of having them hidden away in an album, people will be able to see them. We make documentary films and DVDs, and we also are collecting his works. There are about 60 works. Uh, in a way, like Jesus Christ, he didn't um, sit down and write books, but he delivered a lot of speeches, if you want to even call them sermons. But um, we have collected the majority of them, and we are now in the process of trying to put them into booklet form and reprint them so that uh, younger persons, future generations, can see those um, works. But when you read the works, you'll see that Burnham was really a visionary who had great ideas for Guyana in every single sphere. And we can look at those spheres of, of governance to, to see what um, Burnham had in mind and how he implemented those um, ideas when he became prime minister and president. I want to eventually talk about Burnham's relationship with uh Jagan and, and, and how that would have somewhat helped our nation or not help our nation. But before I ask that, let me ask this. Of course, Burnham grew up very poor uh, in, in an era when uh, Guyana was not rich. We somewhat were still not rich. But the question really is, was Burnham a wealthy man? Did he become a wealthy man? Never. In fact, after his death, his will was published, and I think if my memory serves me right, he, he was just worth about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars You know, his property and everything he possessed, car and everything. Um, it, it, that was not wealth um, 28 years ago, and it certainly is not wealth now. Um, I think most people who buy houses pay about $3 million a board. I had less than a million dollars when he died. Uh, there used to be stories about Burnham having this huge Swiss bank account um, but I remember very well being in a certain bookshop in Georgetown and somebody was asking for a copy of the Ebony magazine which showed that Burnham was the, the third richest um, uh, person of African descent in the Western Hemisphere. And the book, the book uh, seller was showing him, the mag here's the magazine, where's, where's the story? It was no, it was, there's no such story because it was untrue. So I know personally he was not rich. And um, I know that uh, there's no private bank account. I know that because I know the children of Burnham, Fox Burnham, and the grandchildren of Fox Burnham. But um, these stories are, are quite untrue. And they were just invented to vilify a person because um, the People's Progressive Party, in particular, tried to make comparisons between the lifestyle of Chetty Jagger and the lifestyle of Fox Burnham. But um, it is not true. Burnham never had uh, any wealth, and um, he did not live in a, in a lavish style. He, he was quite ordinary, quite simple. And I think that um, when dignitaries from other countries came to Guyana, they were surprised to see, you know, where he was living. At uh, now is now it's called the Castellani House, and I met persons who were critics of Burnham, who went into Castellani House. Um, after Burnham died, 
and said, you know, is this where he was living? It's a very simple house internally. That house used to be used by the colonial director of agriculture, which was equivalent roughly to the minister of agriculture. That house was built on maybe property close to the botanical gardens because that is where the English director of education of, of uh, agriculture lived. So it was never a palace. And you know, if people can pass and see it, it's not but you could go inside, it's not palatial. And if you see where people like the the Jamaican Prime Minister live, you see her, um Borna was living quite humbly. Now you were very close to him as it relates to you know the profession, you were his security advisor. Ninety years after he would have been born. How do you think Burnham would have felt about Guyana's security situation at this point in time? And apart from that, what was his general vision for the security of our nation? Well, I think security is probably the most, um, one of the most important uh, factors in government uh, after he entered office in 1964. And I think the first uh, five years or so were very, very difficult years for Guyana. We had um, a threat by Venezuela to seize the whole Esquibo, because Venezuela claimed the Esquibo. And we had a threat by Suriname to seize the new river. So at first, Burnham had hoped to have a very small defense force. But after those threats uh, from 1966-67, he had to build up the defense force, and he had the, the good sense to, um, to build it up in such a way that, uh, in fact, Guyana never had the military problems that you had in other countries in South America, for example. There's a coup d'etat in, in Suriname, there's a coup d'etat in Venezuela, Brazil at once is under military government, but we never had those problems. Uh, secondly, um, in 1969, we had some severe problems because the United Force, uh, at that time it was much stronger than it is now, uh, instigated a rebellion in Rupununi, and we had to deploy troops to the Rupununi to quell that rebellion. Many people think it's an Armenian rebellion, but it wasn't. It was a rebellion of the, uh, the ranchers, persons who owned vast areas of land, uh, you know, sometimes a small ranch would be like 25 square miles, 50 square miles, and you had much bigger, you, well, the biggest ranch in, uh, in Rupununi um, is bigger than Trinidad and Tobago, it's a huge area. So Burnham had to confront the challenge of ensuring that the attempted secession um, of the Rupununi from Guyana was halted. And um, I would say that he was the fittest person to be Prime Minister of Guyana in those post-independence uh, years. In fact, up to now, we do not have a border agreement with uh, Suriname. We have one, Venezuela, which Venezuela uh, tried to breach. We have a border agreement with, with Brazil. So I would say that um, he faced the greatest threat from our neighbors and we got very little support from some of our so-called friends, and we had to stand alone. But Burnham was a tough man, and he was able to guide the development of the defense force to enable it to protect our borders. And would you say as his security advisor, uh, he was somewhat a mentor to you? Did he ever serve as a mentor to David Granger? Well, certainly I would regard him as a mentor. I was never a security advisor. At the time he was alive, I was a commander of the defense force. Um, I later became security advisor to President Desmond Hoyt. But as uh, commander of the Defense Force, I saw the, the vision, I saw the wisdom in his leadership. Because um, I would say without a doubt that he had a greater or a clearer strategic view of Guyana's defense than some of the military officers we had in the force at the time. And um, this is something we need to, to bear in mind that apart from setting up the defense force, he also created a national service, which had a defense role. It was not a, a military force. You can call it a paramilitary force because it was mainly educational and developmental. 
um, for, for youngsters who are dropped out of school, but they also have military training, so they could be used as a reserve in the time of um, an emergency. And he created a people's militia, which um, allowed us to uh, recruit reservists, persons who would continue their work in normal times, but every so often, maybe once a week or once a month, they would come in and, and receive training. So we did create a defense system in Guyana, um, which is not as expensive as some people think, because most of the persons who were trained were part-time. And we had a small, efficient defense force. But yes, I would say he's my mentor, because he had ideas and he listened to the advice of the professionals before um, jumping to conclusions. He was certainly not a dictator. He was certainly a good listener, and when discussions had been held, plans would be implemented. Let's talk about the burnham Jagan relationship and what that really meant for Guyana or what it should have meant. I mean, in today's society, we, have, we still have aspects of racism where there's separation, East Indian, um, Afro-Guyanese. Now, in that era, we saw an Afro-Guyanese working alongside with an Indo-Guyanese. Why has that not somehow helped more national unity for our nation, or has it? Well, Burnham was the first chairman of the People's Progressive Party. And people may not understand that, but Chet Yagma actually was vice chairman of the PPP. He was never leader of the PPP when Burnham was there. He was vice chairman. And what happened inside the PPP, there was a group of, at that time, pro-Soviet uh, communist uh, activists. There were some young men in the PPP who believed absolutely in the United so um, you know, the USSR. Um, the Soviet Socialist Republics, the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics. And they adhered to a communist philosophy. And they were, in the PPP at the time, persons who were rigidly uh, uh, Soviet. And Burnham was regarded as one of the moderates. He was a socialist, but he did not believe that everything that Joseph Stalin did, that everything that the Soviet Union did was correct. And he made those views very clear. And because of that, he was opposed. So when we look at the relationship between Jagger and Burnham, it would not be helpful to look at the two racial lenses. Um, actually, it was ideological. That Jagger was um, maybe an obedient follower of the Soviet line. You know, when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, he agreed with the invasion, and you know, he supported the invasion. Um, and Burnham said, look, this is wrong. So, uh, Chetty Jagan did not really have a mind of his own. He was a true believer in the Soviet system. And Burnham was more liberal, he's more of a social democrat, I would say. And that is why he eventually left the People's Progressive Party. Not for racial reasons, but because he left with two Indian ministers, Joseph Lachman Singh and uh, Jain Ryan Singh, and two African ministers stayed with um, Shelly Jagger and Sidney King and Ashton Chase. Now, when I speak of ministers, in 1953, um, we had um, a partially, uh, uh, what you can say, democratic government, and we had six ministers, and some of the other ministers were, were provided by the you know, British public servants. But our six ministers were um, Chedi Jagan, Jain Ryan Singh, and Joseph Lachman Singh, Forbes Burnham, Sidney King, and Ashton Chase. But when they split, they did not split on racial lines. You got two of the Africans stayed with Chedi Jagan, an Indian, and two of the Indians went with Forbes Burnham, an African. So we have to look at ideology, we have to look at their beliefs, we have to look at uh, uh, the, the, the philosophy and their own outlook on life. But I would say that the split was not racial at the outset. Mashramani is on the, the Ghana's Republic is on the 23rd of February 2013. Some regard that event, that occasion as Barnum's baby. Do you believe that it has lived up to his expectations, his intentions, what he would have wanted for our people through the celebration of our Republic, the annual celebration of our Republic? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer because 
I still refer to 23rd of February. I prefer to refer to 23rd of February as Republic Day. And I think the thinking behind becoming a republic and the reason for uh, maybe celebrating Republic Day on the 23rd of, of, of February um, have been lost. Um, right now, there's a lot of revelry, there's a lot of jollification, and I can't complain about that. But becoming a republic is a serious step in our in direction of sovereignty, and recognizing the 23rd of February, which was at that time the biggest uh, revolt in the Guyanas, and certainly it is the biggest revolt, one of the biggest revolts in the West Indies. We need to look more at what Kofi and his followers attempted to achieve. We need to look more at what they become, what becoming a republic in Guyana attempted to achieve. And I think sometimes that is lost on the streets of, you know, where we, we are, we are enjoying ourselves. We seem to, it's like Christmas. People seem to forget the reason for Christmas because they're going buying gifts and sending Christmas cards and all. I think sometimes when we speak of martial money, we forget the reason for having this, um, Republic Day celebration on the 23rd of February. Is it fair to blame, and, and of course this is no offense to you sir, but is it fair to blame some of our politicians? Because politicians, both government and opposition, have been accused, especially recently, of politicizing the event. I mean, your thoughts on that? Well, politics is not a bad word. By politicizing the event, you know, I would say we need to ensure that uh, younger persons in the community and younger and future generations understand the reason for the say, observance of 23rd of February. Today is, uh, tomorrow, the 23rd is going to be a special event because it is 250 years since the um, revolt um, occurred. And that is bound to be significant. But um, in terms of politicizing it, I would like to say it should be more politicized so that um, Guyanese understand the political significance of that event and right now I think sometimes um, that significance could be buried beneath the revelry. I don't mean to, to, to go after this but some people may interpret politicizing it as uh, you have half PPP doing one set of celebrations and the other half doing uh, uh, APNU in this case and of course the PNC doing another celebration. Is there a danger in that? Really? Well, there's always a danger because APNU believes in national unity and anything that divides the country is contrary to the ideals and aspirations of APNU. Uh, it is meant to be a single national um, celebration and uh, we should work more towards ensuring that all Guyanese in all parts of the country um, share uh, the celebration. And that is why I, I said that even political terms, the significance is being lost in a, a, an ocean, being drowned in an ocean of revelry. I believe if it went back to its roots, we'd probably attract, um, you know, we can have enjoyment, entertainment, revelry, of course, you must have calypsos and street parades and so on. But at the same time, I'd like to see a lot of emphasis on the educational role of, um, of um, you know, the, the, the festivity. Finally, sir, uh, Burnham died in 1985. This is 2013. Where do you think, I mean, I'm probably asking you to do the impossible here, but where do you think he would have liked to see our nation 90 years after he would have been born? Uh, <laughs> again, that's a very difficult question. I think he wanted to see uh, a country without poverty. I think he wanted to see a nation which was educated. He wanted to see um, a country which was secure, safe. Um, he wanted to see a country where people were healthy and had enough to eat. And in, in many respects, over the last 20 years particularly, we have slipped from those high ideals. And I think if Burnham were alive, we would have been further along the road to achieving those objectives. This has been another informative edition of The Public Interest. Until next time, I am Alaika Ramsey. Goodbye.